sort of late afternoon, early evening, I suppose. Um, well, before I start, I, I have a, a bit of a confession to make. Um, I'm actually a, a failed banker. Um, so before you start sort of booing and hissing and sort of reaching for the tar and feathers, uh, I got out of there a long time ago. Um, in fact, long before uh, we, as taxpayers, uh, uh, became shareholders in this particular bank. Um, when I was preparing for this, uh, this evening's presentation, I was then mindful of the fact that I'm going to be standing in a room full of academics, uh, researchers, PhD students, you know, people that are entrenched in, you know, intellectual rigour, you know, <coughs> thoroughness and planning, um, evidence-based approaches and facts. And um, I was thinking, well, how am I going to make, create a presentation that's going to be both factual uh, but also informative uh, at the same time? And it reminded me of a, a conversation I had <coughs> with a trainer of mine when I was at a presentation course a few years ago. And he said to me, Phil, if you're ever in a situation where you've got to do a presentation and you're stuck, he said, do what I do, and that's don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. Now, I'm not a politician, I'm not going to be sort of playing fast and loose with numbers, but at the same time, I've got a presentation that I want to uh, share with you, which is very much going to be a journey. So I'm going to take you on a journey, I'm going to walk you through this journey. It's going to be a little bit about my story, but it's also going to be about the story of the woman <coughs> in the top right-hand side. Um, her name's Mandy Young, uh, we shall get to her eventually. And through this story, what I'm going to, uh, what I'd like to do is to pull together a range of, the range of themes and topics that you've discussed over the last few days, uh, and you will be tomorrow. So aspects around the, the Ketso kit, around social impact planning and investment, um, around the, the dreamer, the realist, the critic approach, um, the <coughs> golden circle and start with wine. I'm going to try and draw those together as we walk through this particular presentation. Um, and hopefully, when we get arrived right at the end, we'll bring everything together. Now, I just want to give you a little bit more about myself uh, and uh, about my background. I've been involved in social enterprises uh, for about 10 years now. Um, but actually, my social enterprise journey started back when I was a 21-year-old. Um, I decided not to go to university. Uh, I didn't think it was for me at the time. Um, I didn't think perhaps my face would fit, and I thought, well, I'll get a job. Uh, I tried a number of different types of jobs, and I eventually ended up working um, for a major high street bank. Um, I'm not going to name names, but uh, if you've been reading new newspapers recently, a £500 million pound worth of pines for LIBO, LIBO irregularities might give you a clue. Um, and I started very much uh, in the uh, processing room, processing checks as they came through. They come through the machine. It, it was the most mind-numbing job ever. It was very tiring. Um, it was very repetitive. Um, but eventually, I actually worked my way up, uh, maybe by virtue of the fact that I was, uh, I was still there and most people had left. And I got promoted into the, into the accounting house. And there I was processing. I was like, I can actually come in and I'll bundle it all up. And it would go into what we could call our bullion store. Uh, and eventually, actually, I was entrusted as one of the key keepers. And we'd make our way downstairs, and we'd have to double unlock all the way in. I'd end up in a room, not much unlike the size of this room, massive safe. And I remember in there at one point, it was over £330,000 in cash. And I made a quick joke with my manager, and I said to her, I've got my passport, have you? Um, it didn't go down too well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I eventually ended up in, uh, uh, in behind the cashier's desk. Again, I don't know whether that was through her saying, I think we need to move this chap on, or maybe <laughs> it was I had something else to offer. But all the while, you know, I was being told that you know, I've got a future in banking, I could do very well working for this organisation. Um, and I found through my experiences when I was working both in cashier and also on the shop floor, um, that not only was I being incentivized to sell products to people, I've been heavily incentivized to sell products to people. And in many of these cases, um, these people didn't either want the product or really didn't need the product. And I started to scratch my head thinking, well, why am I going to sell something to people that really don't need it? And also having this incentive to do it. And I was trying to find out more about this bank, um, and I did a bit of research for where did it invest its money, and you know, what kind of practices and activities that got into that it got into. <coughs> and I, I decided very quickly that I didn't want to work for this organisation anymore. I was outraged. I thought, you know, this is it. I've had enough of this organisation. Um, and so I decided to leave. I thought, right, I'm going to, you know, I'm outraged. I'm going to take a stand. 
So what I do, well, I went to university for, uh, for four years eventually. Um, and um, I did an undergraduate degree, I did a master's degree in computing and IT. And um, I thought, well, what am I going to do now? Uh, I was a keen athlete, sportsman, I still do a lot of running now. Um, so I wanted to stay on at university, or, or certainly uh, where I was at the time, uh, uh, in Loughborough. And so I thought, I know what I'll do, I'll set up a business. I'm going to set up a web design and internet marketing company. Now, if I knew what I was going to be letting myself in for, I wouldn't probably have done it. It was the most stressful thing I'd ever done. I knew absolutely nothing about running a, a web business. I knew a bit about IT and computing, uh, web design and online marketing, but I knew nothing about running a business. And it was the steepest learning curve I've ever have had in my life. It was absolutely the most incredible journey I ever went on. But I learned a lot. And you know, the, 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 kind of the, the, the short story version of it was that I came out of it in the two years. I really didn't make any money. I didn't lose a, a, whole, a whole load of money, but I didn't make anything. But I thought, I wanted to do something else. I knew banking wasn't for me. Um, you know, there was something around values but, and ethics. I thought, okay. And I knew at the time running a small web design company really wasn't for me. I love technology, I love computing, I love IT, I love problem solving, I love coming up with creative solutions. That's one of the things I love about software and IT development, is there's more than one way to skin a cat. There's more than one way to work your way to a particular endpoint. I loved all that process. I thought, well, how am I going to apply this in a way that, that I can earn a decent living, but also fits with perhaps my own sort of sets of values? Um, I was fortunate enough to get a job working for a, a local housing advice charity. Uh, they were part of the national network of shelter housing advice centres. It was an independent uh, centre, and um, I had the grand title of uh, development officer, which basically meant I was pretty much dog body. Um, I did everything in this small uh, charity. Um, I did everything well apart from providing housing advice. I don't think uh, that would have been a sensible thing for me to do. Um, but they actually had a training arm. Uh, and the charity itself did what charities do. They fundraise, they ask people for money, and they say this is how we're spending it. It got some funding from the local authority to provide housing aid and housing support. And they also got an annual grant from Shelter. But it was largely dependent on fundraising and grant. A part of its income was generated through a trading arm. This trading arm was called Stride. It was a furniture reuse and recycling business. So what it did was that it, it diverted from landfill second-hand furniture it had people that were long-term unemployed through something called a New Deal contract working for them. <coughs> they were being paid to take those people on. They were creating uh, work-based training. They were sending these uh, trainees on courses. Um, I was working with them uh, on job search, which given that my role was marketing manager and I was working and trying to help somebody find a job that really hadn't worked in over 10 years, it was a very interesting learning process for me. So it was involved in furniture reuse and recycling. It created jobs uh, and training for individuals. Uh, it sold furniture onto people on low and fixed incomes. And then it gave away the portion of, of its income to the charity to enable it its charitable objectives. And immediately I saw this virtuous cycle. This, this thing came together and I thought, I get this, I understand this. It's a business, it's a standalone business. It's operating in the marketplace. It's competing with other furniture businesses, with other trainers and other retailers of furniture, and it's also doing uh, good things with its profits. It was actually owned 100% by the charity. And I thought to myself, this is where I want to be. This is what I want to do. Um, unfortunately, um, they couldn't keep me on anymore. Um, I really quite got frustrated. I wanted to move on. I wanted to do bigger and better things. And I worked for a regional housing, uh, regional development organization called Social Enterprise East Midlands. Um, and that's where I was fortunate enough to meet the woman that I'm going to talk about uh, later on, Mandy Young. But my role there was to traipse all over the East Midlands and to find inspirational individuals <coughs> that, that had an idea. They wanted to do something. They weren't quite sure how they were going to do it, and they weren't quite sure what it was going to be, but they wanted to do it. And so my role was to work with people like Mandy um, to help them make their, their ideas happen. Um, if I move into sort of the main part of the presentation, I've got some keywords and <coughs> concepts that, that will feature uh, throughout, throughout the course of this presentation. Um, so, I mean, what I, I had actually in the back of my mind the idea of to issue sort of like a, a jargon bingo card. So that every time you had a bit of jargon from me, one of these, you can sort of tick it off and then sort of shout house because I'm, I apologize that there will be a little bit of jargon. I'm going to try my best to avoid it. Um, but certainly, if you have any questions, I'll explain it. Uh, as best I can along the way. So, 
Adrenaline Alley and this social enterprise. The vision of Adrenaline Alley is to use urban sports to improve the lives of young people. That's very clear, that's the big idea, that's what it's trying to achieve. Um, it has a mission that's a little bit more specific and detailed, which is about providing somewhere that's safe and secure for young people to participate in urban sports. So by urban sports, I'm talking about BMXing, skateboarding, inline skating, and scooters, those kind of activities. Um, it also has an objective to, um, uh, to provide a world-class facility in the center of excellence. That's at the heart of the mission. And also to become a sustainable social enterprise. In fact, this mission really is up for review because we haven't achieved, by and large, the majority of uh, those particular aspects of our mission. So really, we need to reformulate and revitalize our mission with our stakeholders to take a and alley to, to the next phase. But also, what underpins this and what's really at the core of a drone alley as a social enterprise is that we have a strong set of values. Uh, and this is really about how we interact with other organizations and stakeholders and individuals and beneficiaries and our members <coughs> and even our employees and our customers, the, the people that we contract with as a business. So this is very core and at the heart of what we do. And when we provide our staff induction and training, we go through all this so that staff know very clearly about the history and the story of the Grand Alley and how it came into being, but also what we're about and what we're trying to, what we're trying to achieve as an organisation. So this is very much at the core of what we do. Um, I'm just going to take you through uh, just some photographs um, that just give you a picture of really the origin of Drown Alley. Um, I have to apologise for the quality of some of these. It's taken a long time ago and they've been saved and reused and the quality sort of degraded a little bit. But Drown Alley started life as the Corby Wheels project. It's an outdoor BMX and skate park. Um, I actually went to an event in the back of the stand there, at the top right hand side of the, of the picture. And um, I saw this thing going over there, and I went over and I, I, and I met Mandy, and I said, well, you know, what are you doing here? And she said, well, you know, I'm running this community project, it's called the Corby Wheels Project. And I said to her, okay, well, you know, why do you do it? Well, she said to me, the reason why is because young kids in Corby, they don't have anywhere decent to be able to provide, you know, to be able to practice and participate in BMX and skateboarding. Um, uh, I said, well, okay, well, you know, why, why, why is that important? She said, well, actually, because in many sense they're, they're perceived to be antisocial, they're put, they've been moved on by, by the police, um, they've been sort of marginalised, that actually leaves them open to um, crime and antisocial behaviour. And then she told me a story about her son, John. Now, John, her son, was misdiagnosed with a brain tumour. He'd spent most of his childhood in hospital, so he wasn't socialised. He, he, he lacked those interpersonal skills. Um, and so when he came out of hospital, he was bloated and overweight with, with steroids. He had no hair, a big scar on the top of his head. Um, and he really felt ostracised, marginalised, and not part of mainstream society. He was into music, he was also into skateboarding, and he very much, he very quickly became part of that skateboarding fraternity, part of that, that subculture. They took him in and they said, you know what, you know, you're one of us. Now the problem was is that um, he, like many of his friends, were targeted, and he in fact got beaten up, had his guitar stolen, and had his skateboard stolen. So him and his friends complained to, to Mandy, said, look, you know, this is unfair, the police think we're troublemakers, and at the same time we're, 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 we're becoming victims of, of crime. Uh, she said, okay, let, you know, let's do some consultation, let's get some of your friends together. The first consultation she did, 75 young people and their parents turned up. She was like, okay, so I think there's, there's a, a bit of a demand here, there's a bit of, bit of a need here for, for, for something. So she went away and did a bit of research. Um, the next consultation, 150 people came. So word got out that somebody was trying to do something. And the Corby Wheels project was born as, as a community project. I said, okay, well, okay, I understand why you're doing this now, but, you know, you know, how are you doing it? You know, she said, well, actually, I, I generate most of my income just through fundraising, about 80% of our income is just through fundraising. I said, 80%, so the other 20%, where does that come from? I said, oh, well, we run music, we will be charged gate, gate, gate fees. I said, okay, so why don't you just do it for free? She said, well, I, I spoke to the young people, and they said, actually, we would value it more if we got, if we had to pay a little bit to get into the park. I was like, okay, that's interesting. I said, well, what about the rest of the money? She said, well, I run events. I was like, events? She said, yeah, we, we call them Ramp Rock. These are outdoor music events. I said, well, who runs that for you? She said, well, the young people do. And I said, these are the young people that you were telling me about that weren't in school. 
um, or they dropped out or they hadn't gone to college, said yes. So, so how do these run into the So well, I actually sent some of them back to college to do event management and music um, production. I was like, oh really, okay. And so how are you doing that? Well, I was funding it through the charity. I was like, okay, that's interesting. I said, so how did they get here? Um, I said, well, you know, most of them come themselves, but actually she got some funding for a bus, <coughs> and it goes around, uh, well, it's the Kingswood Estate, which is a particularly troubled estate uh, in, Kings, uh, in, um, in Corby. Uh, I was there actually last week, and somebody, uh, I think the week before, had actually got stabbed on the estate, so it's still not without its problems. So I said, so this bus goes around the estate on a Friday evening, on a Saturday and Saturday evening, literally hoovering up these young people and delivering them here. And she said, yes. I said, I bet the police really like you. And she said, yeah, they're really keen on us. And she got a bit of funding to do that. So immediately I got this idea of, well, OK, I know why she's doing it. I've got an idea of you know, what it is and how she's achieving this. The problem was it was an outdoor facility. So every time it rained, nobody came. There was no income. So through the organisation I was working for, we provided some funding for a business plan that said, given a couple of things, this could be sustainable as a business if you moved it indoors. Um, this was the building that became available at the time. It was a 50,000 square foot uh, chicken, former chicken processing factory. And when Mandy saw it, well, what had happened was that the land at the Rockingham Motor Speedway, where we've just come from, was no longer available. And the landlord said, you know what? It's a great building for you. Ta-da! And she burst into tears. She's like, how on earth am I going to do this? But the business plan said that actually this could stack up. My organisation would be able to, was able to provide some capital funding to build some ramps and to fit out the ancillary spaces, reception, toilets, kitchen area, and so forth. So we got a package of funding together, which then resulted um, in a drilling alley uh, being built. Uh, this was the first bit of installation that we, uh, that we built. This was very much in line with the mission. We wanted to create something that was world class, that was going to put Corby on the map. I mean, I don't know if you know about Corby, it's a former steel community, so like many industrial towns, it underwent rapid decline in the 1980s and 1990s, and it's only now starting to recover. Well, we thought we're going to put Corby on the map, so Chorus gave us a <coughs> chunk of cash, uh, my organisation paid for this, some of this ramp, and we built, at the time, which was Europe's highest vert ramp, from the top to the bottom is 14 feet, which is about nearly 4 metres. Um, world Championship champions and professionals came from all over Europe and even the US to come and ride this work ramp in Corby. We put in a, a, a street section, this is called, this is a resi ramp, which what this enables you to do is make a transition from something called a foam pit, which I'll show you in a minute, to being able to do big tricks on these ramps. So what you do is you practice on the far side of the ramp and you land it on the resi because it's a soft uh, coating and you can slide off. And then once you're reasonably confident that you can pull it off, you go on to the hard ramp. Um, every time I see people doing backflips and trip and tricks, heart and mouth moment. Here's the foam pit. Um, much the same as the principle with gymnasts. They you go, you know, they'll tumble along and they'll land into a foam pit. It's the same principle here. There's several run-ins where you can go to the left, you can go to the right, and you can do a manner of all manner of different tricks. Now, what's unique about Joan and Ali is the combination of equipment. There are parts in the country that have a foam pit or have a resi <coughs> or a vert, but they don't have it all and we have that all under one roof. Um, this is something called a street section. Uh, here's a bowl, wooden bowl. Uh, and then some crazy individual doing something I wouldn't recommend. Um, I mean, can you imagine, that's three foot, uh, three, me uh, three or four metres to the bottom and he's another two and a half metres high. Just gives you an idea of, of, of the talent um, that these young people possess. Um, we also have a band practice room. Um, this was just after it's built. We've got drum kits and amps and all that kind of stuff in there. Um, we've got education suites. So we run a study centre um, with a local school uh, for young people that were not in education, uh, 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 well, actually were at risk of being excluded from school. Um, they used to come along here. Um, we also have a disability group as well. So we have a club and we have uh, a range of uh, disabled participants with physical um, learning and visual impairment coming to participate at Drill and Alley. Um, we also secured some funding to put in an integrated disability section. So what that meant was that we modified some of the ramps that any wheelchair could go over. Um, so it didn't have to be a specific park chair. It could be any standard <coughs> wheelchair. 
Uh, we do have wheelchair riders that, that come to our park, and they actually ride the main park as well, because they are of the ability that they can ride the park, so there's no reason why they shouldn't. And we're also um, linking into the Paralympics last year. We are kind of part of this kind of para-extreme uh, movement, which is really about challenging the idea of disability and saying to people with a range of disabilities, um, you can participate in urban sports and extreme sports just like anybody else. So this chap here, Ricky Owen, he used to be a BMXer when he was younger. Um, he broke it, um, he had a car accident and had a below the knee amputation. Um, as part of this Power Extreme video, if you, if you go on the internet, if you search Power Extreme, you'll, you'll get a whole load of stuff that was filmed at Adrenaline Alley. He came to Adrenaline Alley and he wanted to be the first um, uh, below the knee amputee to do a backflip in the UK. Um, and he's still currently working on that at the moment. Um, this chap here, the one on the right in the wheelchair, his name's Aaron Fotheringham, or his nickname's called Wheels. Um, he was the first person in the world to do a backflip, double backflip, forward flip, double forward flip in a wheelchair. And when he came to the UK, here he is here, he's the one on the left by the way if you're not sure. Um, <laughs> when he came to the UK, he asked her and said, I want to go, I want to ride parks in the UK, I want to do a backflip, where, where should I go? Everyone said, you come to the alley. And I met him actually the day that he did it, and he, he came straight in, and his handlers, his sort of entourage, kind of entourage, um, they said, oh, he's looking around the park and he saw the vert, uh, he saw the, the box that he wanted to ride, and he immediately knew that he could do a backflip on it. And uh, I've got a video that I want to show you. I'm Wheels from Las Vegas in the USA. I've been doing WCMX for about 12 years. So uh, they come along as part of the uh, reparation teams and youth, youth young offending teams. Um, we have after school clubs, we have youth groups, disability groups. We have a large number of young local kids coming to Adrenaline Alley. We are operation sustainable, um, so 74% of our income comes from trade receipts, food, equipment hire. Um, I haven't inc included sponsorship in there as well um, because actually our figure really changes, but all of our operational costs are covered by our trading income. So we do get some grants, but they're mainly for capital developments, capital projects to build stuff, which I will talk to you about in a minute. Um, last year we had 55,000 visitors. Uh, we projected for 70,000 by 2014. I'll, I'll show you a chart in a minute. Um, we have a 1,000 new visitors a month that have never been. We don't spend any money on marketing. It's all word of mouth because young people, they recognize that it's safe and secure, that it's one of the leading parks in the country, and the values that we have as an organization. We've now had to call the police um, for the park for trouble. We've had, we have a zero tolerance for drugs and alcohol, and we have expelled probably less than six people in the, in the five years that we've been open. So it's really not a problem for us. Um, we turn over, last year's figure 600,000 pounds, I think this year's gonna be 700, 750, something like that. Um, we're going through an interesting time like many businesses are, and we are a business, we just have social aims and objectives, with the current financial climate, and we're trying to get to the bottom of why that might be impacting on our, on our participation. Um, facts and figures for you here, if you just zoom in, you can see in 2003-04, when Mandy first opened the park, 2,700 participants. And ever since then, we opened the park in 06-07, uh, you can see that it's just a straight line in terms of participation. Every year, we're increasing our numbers. I think we are starting to see a slight tailing off a little bit, um, but we're working to, to address that. 
Here's something called our, uh, our participation pyramid. Um, so this is really the engine. Um, so we have all these numbers coming through our doors, but in terms of our local population, what we try to do is migrate them to our core users. And we then try to move them up through this pyramid to become members, uh, to get involved in volunteering and training activities. These are all part of our kind of core mission of what we're trying to achieve, which is about using urban sports to improve the lives of young people. And then where we can, we either offer them jobs ourselves, or we get them out into the jobs market, or we get them back into further education and training. But this is really the engine, if you like, to what I, well, to our something called the theory of change. Um, <coughs> this is a model that we, we use as an organization to help us um, understand um, the narrative of what we do as an organization and how that translates into um, the steps that we take. So that's really about you know, moving from the what do you do to how you do it to why you do it. Um, and I've just got a you know, quote here. I mean, Vice says, there is nothing as practical as, as good theory. What Vice means is that you need to have a good theory and an idea about how you're going to do it to be able to then implement that as a practical set of steps. But really it's about a roadmap, but not about buildings and bridges and, 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 and roads and those kind of things. It's about having an idea of the journey that you want to take um, and to think about what that final destination looks like um, and to have those mile markers, those, those milestones along the way that you can check the process that you're making, uh, the steps that you're making as an organisation. But what is interesting here is, is this point about the belief system that underlies the importance of travelling in a particular way. Um, so what the theory of change does is it helps to bring all that lot together into a, into a narrative. Um, and it's important because it, what that means is that it enables you to describe the changes and the change that you are making as an organisation, as a social enterprise, um, whether that's through an intervention or a series of interventions or through a, pro, a project or even a, at a programme level. It helps you explain to people why an initiative works. Um, you focus on outcomes, so it's not about output, those discrete, tangible, measurable things. These are the changes that happen as a result of output. Um, it is called the model, something happens, you do something, and something happens as a result. Um, and also it can be linear, y you can do it individually, or you can look at a series of um, theory of change models running concurrently, or even uh, uh, um, interconnected with each other if you're looking at something at perhaps at a program level. Um, but also it's important that you underline these, underli um, underline these uh, underlying assumptions that you have. Um, and we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Um, but what you will produce through uh, um, the process of creating a theory of change model is an outcome or an impact map. Um, uh, and also a list of assumptions. Assumptions are very important um, because you can test them as you go through your particular social enterprise journey. Um, you can measure some or all of the activities. Um, you also map the inputs that you require. Uh, from those inputs and those activities, you create outputs. As I said, those, things, those are the things that are tangible, measurable, discrete. From those outputs, you get outcomes, and of course the impacts, and those longer term changes that happen further down the line which you may or may not have had an effect on. Um, so it's a very, very useful process, and what that enables you to do is to start making this connection between the what you do and how you do it and why you do it um, you know, as a process. But then I hear you say, well, you know, why is this important? <coughs> it enables you to manage cash and resources effectively. So you can decide where you're going to deploy resources, where you're going to deploy cash to a particular activity or intervention. It also helps at the early planning stage to enable you to think through the various steps that you're making, uh, that you'll be working through as an organisation. Um, and also, critically, it enables you to put into place the tools and methodologies and ways of knowing, so sort of the data capture and analysis, if you do it right at the beginning. You can also do it retrospectively as well. Um, and you can do retrospective analysis, but doing it at the start helps you to structure the organisation, helps you to deploy resources effectively, and helps you to put in there a way of, ensure, uh, a way of capturing information. And it also helps keep people informed, your stakeholders, beneficiaries, <coughs> clients, stakeholders, the people you work with. Um, 
And as I said, it's also important because it explains why change happens. You do something, something happens. It, the process of the theory of change and the outcome or impact of the process helps you understand why some of those changes have happened. Here's just a, a, a sample model for a drilling alley. Right at the top, we've got our, our mission, uh, well, our vision, to use urban sports to improve the lives of young people. A slightly more detailed um, mission, as I said, which talks about uh, <coughs> something that's safe and secure, world centre, a world class centre of excellence, and a sustainable kind of research and enterprise. And then you've got the objectives as an organisation. For us, that's enshrined in, within our memorandum and articles of association and then the things that we do. So you can see here that we're getting into sort of the what you do, uh, why, you, uh, how you do it, and the why you do it aspects uh, of, of, um, of the golden circle approach that Sinek talks about. In the next uh, sort of feature, I've actually gone into a little bit more detail where we can see the vision and the mission here, but then also we've got the activity. So what do we do? Schools outreach work, we manage a park, um, you know, we have education study centre, we have music rooms. These are just some of the things that we do. I mean, if I carried on the list, it would be off the bottom of off the bottom of the screen. We have a whole series of inputs that go into that process um, uh, in terms of staff time, and in terms of uh, partnership working. We work with pretty much everybody and anybody. And the reason why we do that is because we want to provide a general in the context for organisations to come in and to do positive things with young people. Um, some of these people are referred to as hard to reach. Well, 25% of the local 30 to 90 year olds, they're not hard to reach for us. So actually, Adrenal is, is a neutral venue where young people come, and then we work with a range of agencies and partners who work with them to provide support or signposting or education or mental health uh, support and, and those kinds of things. And that's very important for us uh, as an organisation. Um, yes, we can just be a BMX and skate park, but actually we want to leverage that to be able to do all the things that we want to, which are aligned to our mission and as an organisation. And here I've got some of these outputs, countable numbers, 55,000 uh, visitors, nearly 50,000 members in our database. And then we talk about, here are our outcomes and our impact. And then, you know, we start getting into stuff around improved confidence and well-being and health and, you know, reduce crime and antisocial behaviour. Well, of course, we can't directly claim to reduce crime and antisocial behaviour. But the inspector, Gary Williams, um, was happy to quote, said that actually Dread Alley is a key part of their strategy. We work well. Corby used to be really good, but he's left, and lots of people have left, and the police there, and nobody knows what's going on, so they're less good. Kettering, um, their police neighbourhood teams are all over in Clenham Alley, and they've secured some home, home, home office funding, where they work, when they're working with young people out in the community, is effectively giving them sort of vouchers to come to the park. Um, so they see it as a key and integral part of their strategy, and actually those um, police community support officers, they come to Clenham Alley, and they hang out informally, with the young people and banter with them and engage with them. So it's a very positive way of working, but clearly we can't claim that we do any of this stuff. I was talking earlier on, Paul, about uh, we were looking to commission some research. Um, <coughs> we have a research proposal, we just want somebody to fund it. Um, what we're trying to do is understand intrinsically what happens within young people taking part in extreme sports. Do we have any psychologists here? Anyone working with young people and sociologists? The switch here. What we're trying to do is understand <laughs> what's going on intrinsically within young people uh, in terms of self-actualization, the fact that they've been working on this trip for, for weeks, for days, weeks, months, and then one day they pull it off. And the, the immediate respect and kudos that they get, not only from their peers, but also the pros that actually circulate within the park, because it's about them versus the ram, not each other. And they come in and say, oh yeah, respect, sick, well done, well done. And actually for young people that may not be engaging with young people, but other, you know, other young people in the community, in, in, in the park, it builds their confidence and self-esteem. And we think that has a positive effect on, on a range of different things, including confidence and well-being and who knows, academic attainment. Of course, we can't claim that we do, but we want to do some empirical research to see um, you know, what we can claim. So this kind of gives you a little bit of a flavor of, of our theory of change. I mean, I've tried to condense a whole load of work into, into one slide, but it gives you just a little bit of a sense 
of, of what we do in terms of our theory of change and our theory of change model. So this is kind of this nebulous, <coughs> sort of woolly area, cloudy, slightly fluffy, of this kind of theory of change. What I want to do is just dive into something uh, that's got a little bit more detail, which is um, around social value propositions. So all the stuff that we've understood and collated through our theory of change model, the narrative that we have created through going through this process, um, we've then incorporated into um, something called a social value proposition. So, I'm oh, sorry, another, another jargon, piece of jargon for you, and another little acronym, <coughs> SPP, which I'll avoid using. Um, but in essence, um, a social value proposition is a very pithy, short, concise statement. It describes what you do, how you do it, maybe provides a little bit of facts and figures, and also differentiates you from what else is out there in the marketplace. So it's a very neat way of condensing, if you like, that narrative that you would have derived, that you would have created through a theory of change model. Um, it's different to a mission. A mission and a vision is you know, all big and all grand, and this is what we're going to do. This is very much entrenched in, if you like, the evidence, the facts of what you do uh, as an organization. Um, so some characteristics, it's focused on a, a key target audience for a market. So in this instance, it talks about beneficiaries. So your social value proposition is targeted to that particular group, so it's very specific to, to a particular group. It's also understandable, so people get it immediately, they know it's for them, and they can engage immediately with it. It therefore has to be relevant to, to key aspects uh, of not only the, con you know, the context, but also the culture that they're in. So it's very, very specific. Clearly, it has to be credible, um, so that comes back to, to my point about rigor. Uh, so it has to be backed by evidence, it's really got to stand questioning. Um, and it's got to be deliverable, it's got to be realistic. There's no point um, making grand claims in the social value proposition, because you're going to get found out if you get challenged by it. Um, it also talks about differentiation, because you're setting yourself apart, you're saying, this is what we do, that's very different to what other organisations do. And it talks about other alternatives, why. It, it is better, if you like, to other alternatives, whether to consume or do something, or to not consume or do something. Um, and it's got to be sustainable. So it's got a sustainable advantage, so it's got to push you ahead of the competitors. It's got to be something very different, <coughs> and very unique, and has a specific flavour, and concise. And therein lies, lies the difficulty. I've, I've copied an example here from the social aid website. It's from the Arvind Eye Care uh, uh, Centre in India. Um, very clear statement. <coughs> we provide low cost, safe cataract surgery in India uh, at much lower cost, uh, including 60% of patients are free and with fewer adverse effects or uh, with fewer adverse events than alternatives. So they've been very, very clear about their social value proposition, about what they provide, where they provide it, something about the cost compared to other organisations. And then it's just a little bit of a breakdown as to the structure of it. If we look at what one is for Adrenaline Alley, um, this very much um, references what we talk about in our vision, which is about providing other sports venues that are safe and secure. <coughs> um, we're talking about young people because that's our target market, that's our target audience. Um, and also we're talking about creating not only positive diversion activities, that's one benefit, but also improved physical fitness, uh, uh, physical health and mental well-being. We do it at scale. 55,000 visitors a year, 25% of the local population. There's a whole bunch of other benefits that we could have put in there. We employ 28 people um, for a start. Um, we have, um, so that, that's the job creation locally, that, that has an economic benefit to Corby. Where 55,000 visitors come to Corby every year, a, a lot of those stay overnight. They're spending money in the local economy. That's not part of our social value proposition because we're not targeting this towards um, investors, economies, economists, or local authorities. We're actually targeting this to young people. Um, and then also we talk about unlike other models. So private parks generally tend to be um, very expensive, have no social aims or objectives, um, uh, and in some instances not, instances not particularly well run. Um, charitable models tend to be quite small, um, mainly grant dependent, possibly unsustainable, and local authorities generally just, we're talking about those outdoor parks that you see all the time, which become magnets for crime and antisocial behavior. So that's a very kind of clear, if you like, pithy 
statement about what Adrenaline is about, um, as expressed in our social value proposition. Um, just a quick little uh, uh, counter through what we're going to do and what we're actually doing for the future. Um, here's our building, this is building one. This was the chicken processing factory that Mandy cried when she first uh, got the keys to it. Um, it's got a range of things. Here's where that vert ramp is. That building is about 50,000 square feet and the park area is about 35,000 square feet that's actually being used. Um, about a year ago, we also got the outline for what you can see for building two and building three. Uh, so we have secured a lease on that building. And um, so we just, yeah, we're just moving on from there. So it's building two and building three. In building two, we're building a high performance uh, centre and competition arena. There isn't anything like this in the UK. This will have the most challenging and state of the art bits of kit in it for BMXs and skateboarders, scooters, scooter riders. This, if you like, is going to be the red run, the black run, if you're into sort of skiing and snowboarding. This is for intermediates and professionals. We've got video, high-definition uh, high video equipment in here that can record these young people doing their tricks, and then you can overlay so you can actually see how a professional does it and how an intermediate does it to make comparison. And we'll have big screens on the wall where you can where you can project this. Um, there isn't anything in the UK like this. Building three is going to be a scooter only arena. Um, we've actually secured some sponsorship from a major online brand called Skate Hunt. Um, their biggest market are scooters. I don't know if you've seen them. They're little two-wheel metal razor scooters where the, where the maybe younger children ride them. Um, many parks ban these scooter riders because actually they are a bit of a nuisance. They don't understand that there are written rules, codes of conduct and etiquette to riding in a park and how you should behave. They snake in and out of other riders, they cut across lines, they stand and sit on top of boxes. So effectively, this is going to be a scooter around the arena. You can ride it as well with skateboards, but it really wouldn't be appropriate for, 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 uh, for BMXs. We're not going to ban scooter riders because we actually see them as the future of urban sports. Um, they're very, very popular, and so what we're trying to do by working with them is migrate them into the rest of the park, get them, they're generally to be younger, so when they're older, get them on BMXs, <coughs> get them onto skateboards. So building two and building three will be complete by May uh, this summer, this year, um, and that's what Mandy's currently working on as a development project. Here at the bottom, we've got some dirt jumps, which we absolutely busted a gut to get ready. We thought, we've got to build it this year, we've got to get it ready for summer 2012. It's going to be the Olympics, you know, it's the Jubilee, it's, the, you know, it's going to be such an amazing, buzzy year, we've got to, we've got to have these dirt jumps ready. Of course, we got washed out, it rained, and we had hardly any, anyone using it, but of course, if we didn't get it ready in time, then, you know, who knows, we might have had a stonking summer and missed out on that opportunity. So we've got quite a large six-acre site now, which, you know, is going to be national centre of excellence. This is really part of what the vision is about, putting Corby on the map and, and providing a national centre of excellence, um, getting people coming from all over the world coming to live, we're looking at camp and stay units and training at Adrenaline Alley. Um, we're working with a nascent organisation called the World Urban Sports Association. Hopefully that's going to be the national governing body um, for urban sports. BMX racing, the Chinese Reed is, is I think the one that you might have heard of. That already has its own national governing body. But urban sports in terms of indoor, park, freestyle, um, skate, um, inline and BMX don't have a national governing body at the moment. So that's what we're going to be working towards as a longer term part of our, uh, of our future. I've got a video I want to show you right now. Um, and it should have auto started.
The journal has been a massive success in the local community. It started off as a small project and it's worked its way up and the amount of people and kids that have actually been involved has been massive. My son was diagnosed with a brain tumour. He was in a wheelchair. He had a lot of emotional trauma. We, we didn't have choices of where he wanted to go in the things that he was passionate about. So when the lottery funding became available, we thought this is our chance to start including some more disabled participants. I mean, coming over since the place has opened, I, I support him all the time. I love skateboarding because it gives me ambition to try new things. Peter's ill with two or three different things. When he skates, he calms down, he's happier. He's got people to mix with and to talk to, friends. He wouldn't cope without being in a position to come skating. The skate park is his life. John passed away in September 2010. The difficulties that he had in his life, so much good has come. It, it's my way of kind of saying to John, I've done everything I can, I, I did everything the best way I can to, to bring your passion and, and, and what you really wanted and let so many people benefit from your loss. It's, it's just dangerous to be forgotten I want to say I'm happy doing it. It's a good thing to do because it's scary and being scared is sometimes good for the heart because you never get anywhere if you've got no adventure. So that was a promotional video um, for the National, National Lottery Awards last year and actually we came runners-up, um, so didn't quite uh, take, take the, uh, the spoils, but we were runners-up all the same, which was a national competition, I think Kids Company, I think you might have heard of, the uh, Ch National Children's Champions, they came third actually, so uh, we're very happy that we did very, very well. But I think that what that video does uh, is sort of really give an idea of why it is that we do what we do at Adrenaline Alley. The first part of the presentation was sort of about kind of what we do and, and how we do it. And you know, the video really kind of sums up why it is that we do what we do. And this chap here on the left, John, was the reason why um, Mandy set up Adrenaline Alley in the first place. It's because him and his friends were fed up um, of either being seen to be antisocial or being victims of antisocial behavior and crime. Um, he died um, in 2010, September. Um, so really, Adrenaline Alley is very much about his legacy. It's about what we're continuing to do. Um, through, through his memory. And when we review and refine our mission, as we will do, part of our new mission and our new vision is about sharing the Adrenaline Alley model um, nationally in other communities. So I'm actually leading on a project at the moment to replicate Adrenaline Alley. Um, the most important thing, of course, is to understand uh, what we do uh, and how we do it so that we can replicate it somewhere else. I know why we do it, and I know why other communities will benefit from having a venue such as Adrenaline mm -hmm. Alley. So that's what we're currently working on at the moment. Um, but like I said, you know, John is very much the inspiration for why we continue to do what we do around ensuring that Adrenaline Alley can, exists where it does in Corby and provide local benefits to Corby kids but also within the county and the region, but also how we can then take this model elsewhere. Um, that's pretty much it as far as my presentation is concerned. As you can see, we've kind of gone on a bit of a journey about me talking about my background and my values and the motivations for for getting involved in social enterprise and social entrepreneurship. Um, we've talked about again key words and concepts and some jargon. Hopefully uh, I've not thrown too many of those at you today. I've talked about our mission, our values uh, as an organisation. So really that's what drives the journey and moving forward. And then we've talked about we've seen some photographs and videos. We've covered off theory of change, which for us is very important to understand, like I said, why it is that we do what we do. Um, and then to be able to express that in our social value proposition and all the sort of marketing collateral and bumps that's associated with that. Um, and, and, and you know that's very much kind of the journey that, that, that I've been taking uh, in this field of social enterprise and Mandy has been taking uh, as, a, as, as the founder and director of Adrenaline Alley. Um, and I think on that note I would like to uh, conclude this presentation. 
Um, and I'm more than happy to take any questions that you may have, or comments, or otherwise. Go on, I know you're itching. <laughs> Yes, sorry. Uh, thanks for really enjoying the presentation. Um, one of your final comments about almost kind of exporting a model for what you've done to, uh, I guess, allow other people to create a similar kind of experience elsewhere. Um, given that you've got a mission to set up a general or to make a general army of like a national centre of excellence, to what extent does that kind of compete or could create a competitor? Um, and to what extent is that not a problem given that you're a social enterprise, not a private mm. enterprise, which is I'm interested in what that represents for you as a social enterprise and how it might be different if you were a private? Absolutely. I mean, our approach, yeah, I mean, we want to be kind of seen as, as, as the Wembley or the Bisham Abbey, if you like, of, of, of urban sports in the UK and operate very much a hub and spoke type model and approach. Um, what we absolutely don't want to do is when we're looking at prospective areas to put in an adrenaline alley is to displace existing activity. Um, depending on how well or not these other parts are run, they're providing some benefit and some value to the local community. So it's absolutely the worst thing that we can do is to sort of drop in a, a bayer moth. If, you know, the, the model that we're working on is, is building one, the, the 50,000 square foot building. That's a large park to drop into a community. And if there was something 20 miles, 50 miles down the road, and it was having to compete with this, then, you know, it wouldn't work in our mutual interest. So part of the replication approach, as I said, is about understanding um, what we're doing and how we're doing it. It's also about getting the business right. So we've spent the last two years investing heavily on staff training and development, partly because of being able to cope with the expansion of the, the six acre site and two new buildings, but also in mind with the replication uh, as well. So, um, so we've been investing very heavily in that. Our model is very flexible. We thought about, you know, there's a lot of talk at the moment in social enterprise land about social franchising and, you know, and, and, and you know, looking at McDonald's and KFC as a model. They've been talking about it for a very long time, and really, there are they are few and far between. And the ones that have successfully franchised, um, there's some peculiarities behind their model that has enabled them to scale and roll up, roll out very, very quickly. So we thought, okay, what we want to do is look at a wholly owned trading subsidiary. So taking lease out of the building, investing our own cash, getting some funding and building part. But then how does that then rela relate to other activities, other, other social enterprise parks in the area? So then what we were looking at as another model is a, is a partnership approach model where we've got a brand that clearly um, young people <coughs> recognize and come to. Um, there may be other partners that have lo good local engagement, but they're, they are either financially struggling or they're not operating at scale that will enable them to be more sustainable. <coughs> so we're looking at how we could perhaps come together with them, because ultimately these things um, live or die based on people. It's about the passion of the individual. I think you, you can see the passion that Mandy has. Um, that's the passion the board shares, that's the passion the staff share. Now, trying to replicate that in community by just parachuting in an organisation isn't going to work. You need to find people who are equally passionate on the ground. So if we can work with those organisations in partnership to ensure that we can increase the impact that a BMX skate park can operate as a social enterprise and do it in a way that's sustainable for, for the longer term, then I think that's, that's really what we're trying to achieve through our replication model. So you'd, you'd create satellite sites in a way, but keep the, the world leading park in 4D? Yes, yeah, so um, I mean, I have to be honest, there in, to try to do what we've achieved now is nigh on impossible. And the reason why is that a unique set of circumstances have conspired in our favour. Um, one of the key failures when people think about social enterprise replication and um, franchising is that they don't understand or they don't fully appreciate the concept of an ecosystem. What is the local context? Who are the key actors and players that are happening in a particular area? 
yes, you can have a model, you can throw in some management consultants that say, this is what you do, this is how you do, and you can process, and you can come up with funky charts and graphs, which is what I've done, and then let's just arrive in this community and, and make it happen. It doesn't work like that. It's, it's about people on the ground. So the situation that we had in Corby was that the Rockingham Motor Speedway, where Adrenaline Alley was to begin with, um, was bought over by, was taken over by a chap called Alfred Buller. Um, he owns large tracts of former industrial steel land and warehousing in Corby. Corby was supposed to be a big town, but in the 80s and 90s it just absolutely floundered. Actually, it was, up until recently, it was the largest town in the UK to not have a mainline train station. So he owns large amounts of land. He said, look, I need my car park back, um, but I'm going to give you this building. That's when we got building one. And so Matt, it was a bit of a fait accompli. He said, basically, you're off, but I'm going to give you this building. She saw the building and she said, I can't do this. I can't make this happen. But actually, he gave us a five-year lease at the time. And we had a business plan up against that. And that is proof of concept. He said, basically, make it work, and then I can see what I can do about helping you to take it to the next level. We got that building rent-free. We pay no rent on that building. So that was one of the things that contingent in our business plan is that, Yes, you can make it work if you move it, move it inside, but it's going to be rent free. That, that's one of the key issues. If you're looking at um, uh, 50,000 square feet, uh, even bargain basement market rates, three pounds a square foot, that's 150,000 pounds a year. You've got that, that's our annual surplus gone. Um, we're also a charity, so um, charities get 80% rate, rate relief. Um, yes, the charitable aims. Uh, support what we're trying to achieve as an organisation, so our aims and objectives are complementary with Charity Commission, so that's fine. Um, if we didn't have to be incorporated as a register as a charity and we could still do what we're doing, we probably wouldn't be a charity, but the reason why we've chosen the legal form of a charity is because it confers this tax benefit, 80% rate relief. Corby Borough Council also give us 100% rate relief, so we don't pay any rates. We're having to make a very strong argument in the current uh, economic climate for them as to why they should continue to zero rate us um, because of the jobs that we create, because we have 55,000 visitors a year. That creates economic value to Corby, the social value that we create. So for the 20 odd thousand pounds that might get from us every year from our rates, we're saying we generate n times more value than that. Please zero rate us. We could do a lot more than 20,000 pounds. So that's what the case that we're trying to, to make. So we've got, and then the land has been given to us for free. So we actually have a six acre site. We've got a long lease on this, but we actually want to move to a position where we buy the land. So we're actually secure as an organization. Um, what you didn't see in that um, map, the, the red line map, was that just where the logo is, just out of shop, the landlord, Alfred, he's building 5,100 homes. Um, so he's got a, a world-class leading um, facility on his doorstep. Um, so that's, that's if you like, a bit of a quid pro quo for him. Of course, he's also got three buildings that he's not paying empty, uh, empty warehouse rates on as well. So we've actually wiped out a big rate liability, rate liability for him. So, and of course we've got Mandy, who has her own story as to how she's arrived at this point. So all of a sudden we've got this unique set of circumstances that are very difficult to replicate. So any other any other adrenaline, alley, you would, you would, not unless you had a large amount of money and was going and prepared to subsidise it, you'd, you'd struggle to for, from today to be able to create something the size and scale of adrenaline. Alley. So that's why we're looking at Corby as the hub, if you like, the world class centre of excellence. That's in line with our mission as an organisation, but to also take adrenaline out, alley out to other communities that would value having something like adrenaline alley in, in their communities. But we're talking about you know, Cardiff and Wales, it's two and a half, three hours, no, four hours drive. We're, you know, we're talking about somewhere in the north west, not so in Manchester because there's a, there's a skate park here. So we have to be sensitive about that. So, but we're looking at anywhere between four to six uh, drone alleys in the UK um, by the time that we've completed um, the, the expansion and the replication. But it will be very much that kind of hub and spoke. You'll be a member of a drone alley and you can pitch up at whichever one and go in and then ride the okay. game. Yes. So just stop. You've gone from something very tiny to something enormous. <laughs> has that been, you know, when you've done your plans and so on, you just kind of push it a little bit each time and a little bit more and a little bit more? Or did you have this end vision in mind that, that you would 
turn out to be that happy. Um, one of the first discussions I ever had with Mandy, one of the first sessions I ever said with her, was that was a, what is the big idea? What do you want to achieve? She said, I want someone that's safe and secure. I want to put Corby on the map. You know, I want to build a world-class centre of excellence in Corby. So we had this wild and crazy notion and idea. And in fact, um, before, um, when this building, one, looked like we would not be able to secure it for the longer term, we applied for some funding called My Place. It was um, education money that was channeled through the big lottery. And we were looking to build a 15 million pound urban sports centre. It was, uh, it, it was a flexible space, it was a rock music venue, you know, it was going to be humongous and that was the big vision. Um, we won't go into it, but my place, in our view, wasn't particularly well run and we were, it cost us about £30,000 actually, we were, we were kept on, on, on the list, on the list, and we kept on to invest more and more and more to, to accommodate other aspects into our plan and it didn't happen and then that's when we ended up with this particular building. But the vision was always about having this big idea. We didn't know how we were going to get there, but we knew that that's what we wanted to try to achieve for Corby. That was, that was the big idea. But I said to Mandy, you can prepare as best as you can for this thing all distance, but ultimately, the minute you hit the ground running, you're off in one direction and you've just really got to go with it. So we never really had a sense that it would look like this. We knew we wanted to, to do something that was unique. Um, but to say that our, our growth was planned in the sense that we, we, we were ready for stuff, no one's ever ready for stuff. When, when, if, you know, this is a small to medium enterprise. When people set up SMEs, I mean, this uh, opened 2007 properly. For the five, six, five and a half years it's been open, you've seen the growth in terms of participation. We have really, really, really struggled to keep up with that. You know, we, you know, we had all kinds of issues around massive, we had high staff turnover because people um, were just thrown in at the deep end because of the demand that we were having. Um, so we've invested heavily on, on getting the right people, but also keeping them. So that means throwing training at them. Uh, we employ local people. We, you know, we employ Corby kids that really haven't done well at school. So we have a tension there. We want, we want to do good things and create jobs for Corby kids that, that haven't got the job. But at the same time, it's like, you know, there, there, there may be learning issues and or there may be, I mean, we, we have a people with physical disabilities working for us. So we have to, as best as we can, accommodate those as part of our mission as an organisation. So it's been, it, it hasn't been planned. You know, we are working, we, we, we're running just to keep up, really, with demand and development as an organisation. Um, I'd like to say, that, oh, yes, it was planned, and yes, and this. No, we didn't have a, a very clear roadmap. Any questions? How much uh, have we spent on it, and how did we find the money? Uh -huh. um, It's been very much an organic process. Um, we mainly begged, borrowed, and stole um, in the nicest possible sense. But effectively, you know, very early on, when I met Mandy, 80% of our income was through grants, and then 20% was through trading. Now it's the other way around, and all our trading covers our operational costs. We get grants, but they're for capital items to build ramps and to build disabled toilets. Um, uh, where possible, we'll take a grant, um, and we've been very fortunate through landfill tax credit schemes. So we have uh, REN have been very supportive of us. So if you if you're a, a waste company and you want to bury stuff in the ground, you've got to pay taxes. That goes into a local scheme, um, a proportion of that goes into a local scheme, and they give that community project. So we've benefited from that as well uh, for I say capital. We don't receive any revenue funding. We actually did to begin with from Sport England. And we had an events participation officer, and her role was to increase female participation and participation with ethnic minority communities, uh, as well as the general population. Um, but that was a three-year revenue-funded program, and then actually subsumed her role into the organisation because we'd gotten over that hump of sustainability where we were actually able to generate our own trading income. The combined investment for building one, two, and three will probably be um, over a million pounds. Um, we put our own surpluses into that, and we are running tight. We are running tight. If we had a major catastrophe, um, we would um, we would really have to think about what we're going to do. Um, we've got grants, and we're actually in a position. Um, we've actually secured a loan 
um, and we're also securing another loan for the overall certain aspects of the development. So we will have a uh, combination, we've got an interest free loan of £50,000 <coughs> and then uh, we're looking at about £90,000, so about £140,000 worth of loans, but um, they are what you could term as soft loans. Um, so we haven't gone out in, into the marketplace, we haven't gone to high street banks for those particular loans. Some of them aren't lending anyway, but that's another story. So it's been a bit of a, it's a cocktail of funding, it's really how it's been operating. Is it going to be difficult for you because now it is so valuable? Well, it's actually the value of the land, uh, and at the moment the, the value of the land is not significant um, because ultimately what you've got is an incumbent tenant that's just converted some warehouses. So if you were to buy the land in the open market, I don't know what the current rate would be, you'd be knocking down the buildings anyway and, and putting a supermarket or some houses there. So, um, so there is a value to the land. Um, what we're hoping to do is once we finish building two and building three by May, we need to make some updates and to improve the fabric of building one, is that that's it, we've spent all the money that we, we will do on our current development, then we will look to using those surpluses that we're generating through the increased participation to then buy the site outright. So at the moment we've got a long, long lease on the site, but our eventual uh, uh, objective is to buy the entire six acre site uh, and the three buildings. Um, we just don't have the cash for it at the moment because all our revenues for the next three, four years is going to be spent on servicing um, that £140,000 worth of loans. Cool. How important is it to have that clear vision and the why and all that kind of stuff in terms of making decisions about going forward? You know, wh when you're presented with options, yeah. What's the role of the why the mission and all that kind of in, in those It's areas? central. It's 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 what informs what we do at Adrenaline Alley. It's the core of the business. It's what informs our decision. We don't we don't don't get wrong, we don't go through every time we want we, we, we make a decision, we reference back to our mission and our you know and, and the vision and the why. But it's something that's inherent and we as the board understand actually this is the right thing for us to do as an organisation. We don't need to sort of sit back and go through some kind of analysis and, 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 and comparison and say, well, how does this fit with our vision and stuff like that. We haven't been presented with any issues that would perhaps cause us to um, sit back and reflect on why it is that we're doing and should we be working with this particular sponsor, for example. Um, and and that, that would be a challenge, you know. It, you are, I would say as a social enterprise, when you are um, being so centrally focused on why it is that you're doing, this is our mission, and that we, we're not going to get dragged away from this, um, that you, you're effectively creating sort of barriers, in a sense, or some difficulties to, for yourself, because you create tensions. You, there are some things that you can, or you, well, you can and can't do, but actually, if you're talking about your mission, then you, you have to overcome some of those concerns. I mean, I, I had a friend of mine who, um, and it was a very oversimplistic argument, but he was doing an MBA and uh, he said he was having, and he's a social entrepreneur, he, he's actually chief executive of Street League, um, major street football charity and educational charity. And when he was doing an MBA, he was having these sort of very oversimplistic arguments with his friends on the main MBA programme. And he was saying, well, I, you know, I'm a social entrepreneur and this is what we do, and this is why it's really cool and stuff. And you as kind of, you know, sort of Yahoo capitalists, you know, you're taking the path of least resistance to, you know, generating as much profit as possible and, and not thinking about those kinds of externalities, you know, the impacts that you're, you're affecting on the environment or communities or, or, or people over somewhere else or further up the supply chain or down the supply chain. But it was an interesting argument and an interesting debate, but it is very much still very core to us. And it's, thankfully, we've not really had to um, have those kind of serious discussions because we're just so much in the, biz the business of running the park. I did say, actually, that our mission is going to be, is up for review, really, because we do want to think about broadly how we broaden out and how we broaden out our vision and our mission as an organisation. But that's going to be an exercise that we conduct, you know, with our stakeholders because they're very much a part of what we do as an organisation. Uh, do you think that the fact that this is a social enterprise makes it harder to run <coughs> than any other type of business, or is it uh, just more complicated? Um, 
Running any sport and medium enterprise is a complicated and difficult, bus difficult business. I think in some senses our life is made easier. Um, so, you know, because we, are, we can sort of plead this like poor impoverished charitable hat when we need to, we can get great relief. Of course, we, can, we feel that we can demonstrate that value. We feel that we can demonstrate value to the landlord um, who, who's building 5,100 homes literally 600 metres away. Um, if we were a private, you know, if we were a profit-making business, um, and Mandy and I were the directors taking all the profits, then um, our life would be difficult in a different way. So, I th you know, I think it would be oversimplifying to say that it is more complicated. I think there are certain aspects about so setting up social enterprises that are perhaps more complicated than setting up and registering business. If I wanted to set up a company, I could, I could go online and do it tonight, and I could get my papers probably within 10 days. If you want to set up a social enterprise in the way that we set up the Journal yeah. Alley, then you know we re you know registered as a charity, we have to report to the charity commission, and also we've incorporated it as a company as well. So we've got dual sets of reporting to do to the company's house. So you know we've made our, our our life a little bit more difficult in in that sense. So, but those are some of the kind of like peculiarities. I mean. The lead-in time, I think, having worked with people wanting to set up social enterprises, uh, for some types of social enterprises, depending on the sector or the activity and what you're going to be doing, I think it takes a little bit longer because access to finance, for example, or you know, incorporation, those kinds of things. So there are some differences that I think make things complicated, but I don't think it's going to be the same for every social enterprise. I mean, I, I know social enterprises that can set up very, very quickly and have grown very, very quickly, but their model has been, you know, slightly different, shall we say. Yep. Question is a little bit of curiosity. How do you deal with gangs? Um, well, I think, I mean, fortunately for us, um, well, I am not aware that there's a real problem with gangs in Corby. There may or may not be. But what I do know is we've never had to call the police to a general alley because of any kind of incident. Um, we have, I mean, there was a stabbing, as I said, on the Kingswood estate, um, and actually I know there was another death as well just over Christmas recently. Um, I don't know whether they were gang related. I know one of them was to do with mugging. But I know that we've never had to call the police to a general alley. We have a zero tolerance on drugs and alcohol. The park effectively polices itself. So we've had, um, because of our po policy of drugs and alcohol, we've had riders coming up you know, saying, oh, such and such, you know, you can see Stone is completely off his, you know, high as a kite. He's a liability, he's a liability to himself, and he's a liability to us. And he's effectively been shocked. Um, a member of staff has gone over there and said, look, um, I have reason to believe that you are an influence, you know, can we talk about this? And uh, we also, as, as part of the um, their disclaimer, them signing the park, they also agree to undertake with cause testing, um, either, uh, breathalyzer test or urine test for, for drugs. Um, they can leave if they want, they can walk straight out the door. Um, in the five, five years that we've been open, I think less than six or seven people have actually left or been asked to leave the park as a result. So we don't have any trouble. It seems that, that if there is a problem in the community, that <coughs> gets left really outside. Um, but I think we're fortunate if we were perhaps in another area where may, there may be an issue of, of gangs, I don't know, or territorialism, um, BMX and skateboarders can be very territorialist. I don't know, but it's, it's, I think people value it so much and they want to be so much a part of it is that all that business <coughs> gets left outside. That's my feeling, but I don't have the evidence and I hope I'm not proven wrong either. Um, you mentioned in your presentation for Public 3 that it's going to be devoted to scooters. Mm. And you said that you feel like that's where uh, the future of these kind of extreme sports are heading. But how did you figure that out? Do you, do you keep statistics or mm. is there just certain trends that you're following? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, well, you saw the graph. Mandy started counting stuff from day one. That's absolutely important. Um, we know their ages. We know where they're from. We, you know, we, 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 uh, you know what we know of discipline they are, um, what, you know, what their main preferred discipline is. Um, and BMX is a BMX is. Skateboarders, they're long suffering, they're skateboarders. So, do we have any skateboarders in the house? Anyone here? They, they, they are, you know, that is their, that's their passion and they work away at it. Um, 
When the drill early started out, it was about 60% BMX. That's actually started to increase, and we were seeing more of the BMX path. And what that meant was that actually skateboarders were being pushed out of the park. So we built a skate skate only area just to cater for that particular community. They've sort of started to come back, but not really in the numbers that we wanted to. Um, BM skateboarding tends to be lower. Um, so vert, what you saw Peter doing, there aren't that many kind of big vert skate skateboarders. It's very much pecky street stuff on park benches and you know town town centres and steps. Um, that's really what where they're interested. BMXing is the trend is shifting from the park over and over and over up the other side and over and over and over all the way back. Um, it's shifting from that to more street and more techie kind of stuff. Um, so there are kind of subtle, there's ebbs and flows in terms of the overall disciplines, but within each of the disciplines, so you've got BMX vert riders, you've got street, you've got skate, you've got flatland, you've got empty, you know, you've got dirt. So, and there are, you know, areas in ascendancy. What we're lucky is that we haven't set our stall out in one particular area, because if that was to become less popular, then we're going to have to struggle, we're going to have to repurpose the park. You can build generic parks, uh, ramps that people ride, but actually what brings people in is stuff that skaters really love, you know, stuff that BMXers really love. And that's and because we have such a large site, we can cater for the majority of disciplines where I think we can weather some of those shifts in participation. What we started to see in building one was just an increasing number of eight-year-olds arriving with their parents like that going, ah. Oh playground and literally they just go charging off into the park and all the BMXs and I mean you've got an eight-year-old who weighs whatever 30 kilos 25 kilos and then you've got a 19 year old on a BMX doing going at 20 miles an hour he weighs 70 kilos mm, it's not nice thankfully we've not had those, those problems but we tried to avert that because we started with a um, we had sessions for a particular scooter evening we had a scooter riding session on a Saturday morning. You see, scooter riders generally tend to be younger, so they're not certainly teenagers who sleep in at night. They're up first thing in, in, on a Saturday morning. So they, they come with their parents and they have breakfast at our park, and we have a nice little 12 session. And then we kick them out, and then at sort of midday onwards, you know, the teenagers are sort of arriving like that, wiping the sleep from their eyes. That's worked well for us. Then we talked to Skate Hut. The majority of their business was actually scooters. Um, they, 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 we're going to sponsor, we want to sponsor Building 3 and build a scooter around the arena. That gets our brand out there in front of the new market. We also want to cross over and get a bit of credibility with skateboarders and BMXers. They know that they can achieve that by partnering with us. What we want to do, I mean, a scooter ring is here to stay. Um, and the age profile at the moment of scooter riders is younger, but I think you'll see them getting older and you'll get professionals now, you know, you will get them in their 20s. I mean, scooters are a phenomenon that's probably only been around for six years, seven years, really. Um, so you start getting pros in their 20s. But I think a lot of those scooter riders, if we are clever and we do the right things, we can also you know, migrate them onto bikes and boards. So again, it's part of our sustainability, um, and it works well for, scoot, uh, for Skate Hut as well because, because of the, the partnership relationship that we have with them. Now, is that okay? Yeah. I was just wondering what your own actual cost to the service you do, because obviously there must be a balance between the area of kids who want to <coughs> play these kind of skate parks yes. and actually being able to sort of turn over enough money that you can maintain them, pay the staff, keep them um, expanded and things yeah. like that. So what's yeah. the actual cost to the, the person who goes in yeah. to the skate park? On balance, Adrenaline Alley is the cheapest in the UK of all the next skate parks. And I have to say that. We were going to go down a kind of com as the comparison chart with, with you know, with transgression and, and with all these other parks. Um, we didn't want to go down that price wheel type route because also it's very difficult comparing. You know, some do all day sessions, some do morning, some do afternoon, some do skate only, and it was complicated and it was too difficult. But on balance, we're actually one of the, we are probably the cheapest park in the UK. The reason why we can do that is because we can get the number of participation. Participation drives revenue, so that works. That's our model, basically. Build it big and get them in, keep the prices low. So there's an annual membership. I think it costs mm, about 10, 15 pounds. That reduces your uh, gate cost by about 30 percent. It works out roughly. Well, let me think. I know full day sessions about 13, 14 pounds for long day sessions. So that's from. Um, um, 
midday till 10 p.m., 9 p.m. costs about 30, 45, just over a pound an hour. Um, and also for Corby kids, we live in the Corby postcode area, we get free membership. And we also have a Corby on the evening uh, event as well. Uh, I think it's one, one, one Friday every month. Um, so that's really about trying to make it affordable and accessible to, to like Corby kids. Um, there's also another little wheeze, because what we don't want to say is that um, uh, you're poor, we know you're poor, and we're going to pat you on the head and you know, come in and we're going to sort of you know, patronise you. So we have schemes that we've worked through youth groups uh, and our school clubs where um, and, uh, and, and that's either for core users that come in through that route or new potential members that come in through that route. So there are ways and means of, of doing it, but ultimately it's a balancing act. Uh, we've got you know, equipment hire, um, we've got events as well, uh, of course food and, um, and, and um, you know, refreshments on site. We know that's a big area of development for us and we can really increase the, the offer and the quality of what we're providing. Not only for the participants, we get, I mean, I spoke, I had a conversation at the end of last year, grandfather drove his two grandchildren um, two and a half hours, and he said, I, I bring him here once a month, A, because they're driving nuts, because they talk about this place all the time, but B, there's a part near us, I just don't feel safe, like I have to watch what they're doing, here I can just let them run off, because I know that all your stuff is first aid qualified, um, I know that you know they're circulating and doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, we're working very hard to improve the visitor offer for parents. So we, we're going to have parents' lounges, with flat screen TVs. We're actually looking at um, putting in Wi-Fi as well, so people can sit there and, and do their do their work. Um, so really, to make it a far more pleasant uh, experience for parents, um, grandparents, and guardians, and of course encourage them to spend money um, whilst they're there. And of course, sponsorship is the big opportunity for us because we've secured quite a sizable chunk of funding for sponsorship for Building 3. We've got Building 2 and Building 1 as well, so, so those are kind of two areas that I'm going to be looking at in the next 12 months. <coughs> Any other questions?